The One Dollar Horse is about uh, 15 year old Casey Blue who lives in the east end of London. Uh, volunteers at a very rundown uh, riding school and dreams of being uh, going to the badminton horse trials and um, winning. Um, but it all seems impossible, especially when her father is an ex-con, um, until one day she rescues a horse. I, I'd always, always wanted to um, write a horse book. Um, I was, I, I had a horse when I was, well, we had eight horses when I was growing up in Zimbabwe. Um, I was obsessed. I, I, I got my father to um, build me a sort of cross-country course through the game reserve. I was obsessed with, you know, somehow getting to the Olympics or going to badminton or something. So um, as I started writing children's books, um, my editor, uh, Fiona, also loves horses. So we always used to talk about, well, I'd, I'd love to do a horse book sometime. And, and then she said to me, well, if you're serious, um, you know, come up with an idea. And I tried and tried and tried. I could not come up with an idea for the life of me. And, um, and the morning came when I had to go and meet her with my idea. And I had no idea. And I thought, oh dear, this is going to be a really embarrassing meeting that I've had like a year to come up with an idea, and I have none. And it was the most bizarre thing. As I was literally sitting down at breakfast, having a, a ponder about my lack of ideas, um, the idea just came into my head. But so vividly, like instantly, I can remember being, I, I wrote, I, 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 and the idea for the sort of series came into my head at the same time, and I... I wrote it down, I, um, I wrote it all out for her, and, and I remember sitting on the train going into London and thinking, I know these people, I mean, they're so vivid and real to me, and I suppose I always sort of felt different to other people. I, always, um, I was always really fixated on following my dreams, and although everybody at school has dreams, I really didn't want to be somebody that didn't do those things and it seemed to me so many adults that I met um, would say oh I want to be a writer and I want to be a singer when you're, I was your age I wanted to do this and yet they hadn't done those things and, of, and now that I'm older of course I understand why that you know like life just doesn't unfold like that necessarily but I didn't want to be I was determined somehow I had to do something with my life. Um, I first came here when I was 17 I, um, I had uh, I, I always had lots of dreams when I was growing up, and I, I always um, I wanted to do something in the arts. I didn't know what it was, and, and for a long time I wanted to be a singer. And um, I um, I'd left school when I was 16. I went to art school briefly, and um, I uh, while I was um, at art school, I was realizing that I was it was going to be many years <laughs> before I became a successful artist. So I thought maybe I'd go back to the singing idea, even though I can't actually sing very well. Um, so I just announced to my mum um, that I wanted to go to the UK to become a, a singer. <laughs> and my mum is one of these people who is a very big believer in, in um, following your dreams. And she basically sort of said, bon voyage, and um, put me on a plane at 17. And I came here for a year and I worked. I, I managed to get a job uh, straight away, incredibly, as a training as a veterinary nurse. So I spent a year here working as a veterinary nurse and I was incredibly poor. All I ate um, for a year was um, bran, all bran and um, potatoes. And we managed to get various things from that were intended for the animals, like um, supposedly like purity baby food and cup of soups. I ate a lot of cup of soups, I drank a lot of cup of soups. But yeah, I was very poor, very cold and um, that was majorly, mainly my impression. You know, it, I think traditionally in children's books it's easier to somehow get rid of the parents um, and so that children have the, the freedom to do different things. But I think more than that, I'm very interested in, um, I suppose, the isolation uh, that a lot of children feel. And, that do, and you can feel that whether you've got two parents or one parent. And... Um, when I was growing up, my uh, I grew up during the, the uh, a war in Zimbabwe, and um, my father was away a lot um, in the war, and he was a farmer. So even when he was there, he was gone from four in the morning till uh, seven at night, pretty much. And my mum travelled a lot, so she would be gone for like uh, six weeks at a time. And my sister's eight years younger than me, so I spent a lot of time on my own. I also 
I went to boarding school and although I had lots of friends there, I think I'm for it. that feeling of being the sort of solitude of childhood, even if you're completely surrounded by people, even if you do have people in theory in your life, I, I can relate to a lot and, and I'm very interested in it because actually I don't always think it's a bad thing. I mean, for me, I was fine with it. You know, I never felt um, lonely or I wish my parents were around more at all, actually, because I was always drawing or I was in the game reserve, um, you know, watching animals or writing stories or dreaming. So I, um, I think it's a, it's a good thing for your imagination. Well, firstly, I think people don't realize May, maybe the, the recent incident with, with horse meat being found in people's burgers, you know, has drawn attention to the fact that, yes, horses do meet the most horrible fates. And I think people don't... Uh, because horses are uh, quite an emotive issue, the, the, the sort of welfare of horses, because horses are seen as very sensitive and people love them. And we, wa we want, I think most people want to think of horses in beautiful circumstances. We want to go to the races and see them looking magnificent. We want to see, <coughs> excuse me, magnificent Arabian stallions parading around and, and see cute little Shetland ponies in people's backyards. But the reality is that, that a tiny percentage of racehorses um, have happy lives. Only the very, very best <coughs> excuse me, in reality have a nice life. You know, that most of them have quite a horrible life. And, and that's, th these are truths that, and people grow out of their ponies and then where do they go? You know, pets end up at, uh, you know, in all sorts of horrendous situations. And, and I mean, I, I just think that these are really important issues that uh, it's important to face, but it's also, Thankfully, there are lots and lots of people like Casey who who would like to rescue a horse and do you know, help horses. And there's amazing horse whisperer people, not just the horse whisperer, there's amazing people. And so now, in a way, we know more about communicating with horses than we ever did. So, so those are like the, the amazing positives about it all. So, excitingly, in June, um, there's a publication of your first adult book, fiction adult book, sorry, um, the obituary writer. How difficult is it to get into the mindset from writing for children to then suddenly writing for adults? It was very, it was very interesting last year. Well, firstly, the obituary writer has been written over about four years, so I've always written it kind of in my spare time, which in the beginning, I, I, when I was writing one children's book a year, I had kind of had more of, and I, I'd be writing it in the sort of second half of the year, and then it kind of got to, I'd write it a bit of November and December. And then finally, I was, last year, my publishers offered me a chance to, they extended a deadline so that I could finish it in the middle of the year. And that was, that was quite strange because I, I was writing Race the Wind and then I stopped and I was writing the obituary writer. Then I went back to Race the Wind, which is the sequel to The One Dollar Horse. And then I did something for younger readers. And so I was sort of switching eight and then I had to do the obituary writer edit. So I was sort of, switching all the time but like I said I, I think because like the story to me is the most important thing and I, I find it um, I wouldn't say e I, you know books are incredibly hard to do but but I don't find it difficult to go into different head spaces I, and I find it I love stepping into the head space which was essentially how I thought when I was between the ages of 8 and 16 and I, I, I find that quite a, a nice headspace to go into but equally it was really really lovely being able to write the obituary writer and go into that totally different kind of more complex headspace. I always thought no matter what I did with my life I always wanted to write and I'd, I tried writing my first book when I was 10 so and I tried again when I was 17 and again when I was 19 and I finally succeeded when I was 22 and it was it was always I just always had it in my head like not even the first I remember the very first day that I um, I worked at the veterinary practice. Um, at the end of the day, I went instantly and started making notes, and I thought, oh, could, maybe I could do a book on this. Um, but I think the main problem was that I, I wrote non-fiction because I became a journalist, and, and I started writing non-fiction books. But I never thought, I never had ideas, ever, ever, ever. And that was a huge source of frustration to me, because I, I thought, oh, one day I'd really love to be a novelist, but I, I kept waiting for this 
amazing ideas come into my head and they never ever did and until I guess in, in sort of in my mid-twenties I started to think I whatever that imagination gene is I, d I don't have it and and that was um quite hard for me to come to terms with because I because I it had been something I'd always always wanted to do and as much as I loved non-fiction I just thought I I wanted to do that so badly and I felt that after <laughs> 20 odd years of no ideas like even kind of basic ideas didn't come to me or if they did you know they wouldn't be and then uh, until that really the day the white giraffe came into my head and then the strangest thing was I, I don't know it was almost like it unlocked a box in my head because now uh, ever since then ideas come into my head all the time like lots of ideas so so I feel very relieved because um, it's something I love so much it's such a a beautiful thing to do for me to sit at my laptop each morning and and just open the door into another world.